Today is April 25th, 2023. This is the Blockchain Journal podcast. I'm your host, David Berlin, and I'm coming to you from the Consensus Conference in Austin, Texas, where right now the Enterprise Digital Asset Summit is taking place. And I am standing with Patrick White. He is the co-founder and CEO of Bitwave, the producer of EDAS, which is the acronym for that summit. And we were talking off camera for a little bit, and I thought, okay, I better grab this guy for an interview because you guys are deeply familiar with many of the challenges to adopting blockchain in the enterprise. So first of all, thanks for joining on, on the show. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so as we at Blockchain Journal look at all the different barriers to adoption, one of the things that we saw was that the current supply of special systems to do all your accounting, your back office, SAP financials, Oracle financials, generally speaking, not very well tuned to the nuances of dealing with cryptocurrency. Whether those nuances are just the idea of looking at the fees you pay just to use a chain, or if you're accepting payments in cryptocurrency, uh, none of these things really take into account, none of these existing systems take into account all the challenges, for example, volatility. While we were talking, I learned that you guys work very closely with one of those systems, Net, NetSuite, so, and uh, you do something special to kind of help overcome those weaknesses in the existing sy system. So I'll stop there, Patrick, and let you take over and tell me a little bit about what Bitwave does. Perfect. So it is, you know, Bitwave is what is called technically in the accounting world a subledger. So it is to say is that we are a accounting and tax subledger for digital assets and cryptocurrency. It is uh, we work with all the different big ERPs from NetSuite to QuickBooks to Zero, Sage, Workday, up and down the stack like that. What makes crypto so hard to work with for traditional ERPs is that crypto is kind of the unholy child of both an inventory as well as a, a forex. So it's a forex foreign currency in the sense that you pay people with it, right? Like, I pay bills with it, I get paid with it, I pay my employees, my payments, all that kind of stuff. So in that sense, it feels like euros or, or Great British Pound or anything like that. But it is treated like a inventory item for uh, tax purposes and accounting gap purposes, which is to say that you have to track lot by lot every single coin you ever get, and you have to relieve it. So in a traditional ERP like NetSuite, that's actually two different modules. You have a, an inventory module to do item level tracking, and then a separate Forex module. Bringing those two together is just not possible in, in traditional ERPs, and it gets even harder. You know, crypto has, ETH has 18 decimal points. Um, Bitcoin is a better example, because you, know, you get down to 18 decimal points on ETH, and it, it doesn't matter anymore. That's below, that's you know, 0 0.00001 cent. Bitcoin does matter. Six decimal points for Bitcoin is still uh, material. So that six decimal points for Bitcoin today is uh, greater than, is more than $100. So that is actually real money that you are, that you are dealing with at that point. What do traditional ERP systems go to, two? So, like two, three, you know, some of them, you know, maybe get to four, but it really, you know, QuickBooks starts, stops at two, so it's, it's not designed for this kind of stuff. And of course, none of them are designed to handle these really complex transactions. Crypto transactions are not like bank transactions, right? A bank transaction there is like, there's either it's a to or a from, there's a single amount, there's a single ticker. That is not a crypto transaction. A crypto transaction is one transaction on the blockchain with a bunch of ins, a bunch of outs, a fee that gets paid. You know, with this new uh, 4337 protocol, someone else could pay a fee and you could use USDC to satisfy it. I mean, it is a crypto transaction is is crazy and incredibly hard to to both bring into a register view like you'd be used to in, in assets. So that's what we do is we bridge the gap from all of the new blockchain technology systems into the into the traditional finance world, and it is a blast. It's a blast. <laughs> How many enterprises are taking a look at Bitwave, and who are some of your customers that are helping uh, that you're helping to figure out how to bridge this gap? Because there aren't a lot of enterprises, generally speaking, that have embraced yeah. crypto yet, but there are certainly a handful of early adopters. Yeah, so we have over 300 clients, it's, uh, which is incredible. I'd say about uh, a quarter of those are Fortune 50, Fortune 500, those types of customers. Companies like GameStop, companies like Nike, companies like you know, OpenSea, Magic Game, those are more crypto native companies, marketplaces for NFTs, but boy, they feel like enterprises because they are large companies doing millions of dollars a year in transactions. Uh, in some cases, 250 million transactions a year. So this is where you start to also diverge from traditional ERPs. You know, traditional ERP like NetSuite, they will scope, uh, their first quote they give you will probably have like a thousand transactions a month on it. 
I don't think we have a client that does a thousand transactions a month in crypto, and we have clients doing 50 million, 100 million, 250 million transactions a year easily. Like we're working with someone right now who has two billion transactions a year. So the volume of what you actually have to do in this is, it's, it's unprecedented in the accounting world. Like the people who deal with this are like Walmart. And Walmart has a full sub ledger, they have a bunch of technology, they probably have a thousand person finance team that does this. When we talk to someone like Magic Eden, they've got a three person finance team. It's, it's like three brave warriors with a, with a shield dealing with 250 million transactions a year. It is a totally different ball game out here. And some of the things we've seen so far here at your event with the speakers on stage, is there talking about how complex many of those transactions are, or tracking. What, I, what I'm really getting at is, is that there's no standard for how any individual chain handles the accounting on the chain itself. And because of that, you have to, like from Avalanche to Ethereum to any one of them, that they're all so different that you have to somehow bridge the gap between these and the traditional ERP systems. That means you have to come up with essentially a standard, uh, a separate API for Every all of them? of them? Every single one of them. I mean, we integrate with over 50 chains and each one of them is difficult to integrate with. Each one of them has their own challenges. It's like integrating with hundreds of banks that all have a different way of working, like a different notion of money. Like, it's not just 100 banks that all have, you know, one transaction, one amount, one, one dollar sign. It's like everyone has a different way it works. Subtransactions, meta transactions, different types of staking, and withdrawals, DeFi. It is uh, really, really crazy. And, you know, we're getting closer to standards. Like the big news that we talked about, we had a, a big session this morning that was all about this thing called, the FA, we call it the FASB update. FASB is one of the accounting regulatory bar, boards that covers US GAAP accounting. They recently released a, it's not a final, uh, it's not a final guidance yet, but it's, it's approaching that, that was all about how to account for digital assets. We're getting there. It wasn't perfect, it left a lot of stuff out. It's gonna, in the short term, add more complexity before the complexity ratchets back down. But we're, but we're slowly getting something it's very usable. But then the other part that was great about the show is we've been seeing a lot of really cool tech, like um, the streaming payment stuff was incredible. Did you get a chance to look at that? I did see the streaming payments tech. I didn't I didn't quite understand where enterprises would appreciate it. I, I saw where other entities, or let me say that, where non-crypto native enterprises might appreciate it. For example, you don't. I don't think you see a lot of enterprises getting into staking. Uh, they're probably doing other things like they're making NFTs for customer engagement, or they're accepting crypto payments, or making crypto payments, but staking, didn't see, so, so it seemed like that was one of the primary applications there, but maybe I got it wrong. So the, the streaming payments is a, a, it's, it's a long time use case that we've all been hoping is going to come to crypto because the way, there's this great story that I, it's a, you know, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. There's this great story that like the first car that ever got invented, they put a stuffed horse's head on the front of it. And it would, the idea was it was both, it would make the other horses more comfortable. It would make you as a user of this car, like understand what you were doing. You're, you're riding a thing. Um, I, I think it's been totally disproven that's not a real story, but I love it anyways. And I feel like we're in that horse's head with crypto phase with crypto right now, where we're trying to take Take current processes like ARAP, which is, is how bills and invoices get paid at big enterprises, and we're trying to adapt them to a, cr a crypto world. And it's better. Like, it's not uh, order of magnitude better, it's a little bit better. So, like, right now, I can send a wire, it takes a call to my bank, it takes a day to settle. There's some complexity, I get hard questions like, have you talked to these people on the phone and tell me your social security number? But like, it, it works. So we're saying that, well, hey, crypto can let me settle that instantly. I click a button and suddenly a million dollars moves from my account to that account instantaneously. That's instant settlement. That's really, really exciting. So businesses already like that idea. Streaming is taking the next side, which is to say, you know, the traditional way that invoicing works at enterprises is you come up with some sort of number. Like let's say net 30, net 15. That says you have to pay me this bill within 15 days receiving the invoice. And that means that you will, on average, you know, you're probably gonna get it at day 15, but you'll on average get it at day seven, like something in that range. Streaming says, hey, I'm gonna open up a channel between my company and your company, and we're gonna stream money. So you're gonna send me a bill, and the first day that I'm using your service, you are gonna get one day's worth of money streamed into your account. On average, it's the same. It's still, you're gonna have, all of it will be delivered by net 15. It will average out to be delivered by, by net seven, but you're actually getting immediate access to it and I'm holding on to my funds longer. So I'm actually holding my funds until the very, very last minute and earning interest on it, things like that. So, and then you- It's the utility model. It, it turns, turns everybody, all businesses into a utility, pay as you go, 
But why can't a smart contract just do all of that? That is that that's a smart contract doing that. So that's this is the you know who we brought on stage here was a company called Superfluid. They've built a suite of smart contracts to do this work. So this is it's the first time that we're really seeing rubber meets road on this use case. And then it, that of course then brings a lot of complexity around accounting that we have to deal with, which is how do you account for it? Because you obviously can't pick up a transaction every second. Your accountant will uh, come after you with a hatchet, uh, the shining style. So you have to find some other mechanism to account for it, whether that be rolling up hourly, daily, weekly, whatever. It is. So there's and, and so Superfluid is providing sort of a standard way for enterprises to start behaving in this way, as opposed to writing their own smart contracts, which by itself is very problematic. And that's that's one of the big issues in this. Is that's so we we include them as part of like the infrastructure here because at the end of the day that kind of smart contract is really hard to write and it's really hard to write securely. So we don't want every business writing that. You know, you don't want, you know, let's take uh, Nike's a good example. Like, you don't want Nike writing that contract because that's not, like Nike's really good at, they're good at branding, they're good at shoes, they're good at apparel. They're not good at writing smart contracts. Maybe they have some there that's amazing at it. That's, I'm not going to disparage them, but the idea is that like, let's take people who are really good at this and let's start building these protocol layers that anyone can use and that's, you know, that's what we're talking about here. You have companies like Superfluid that's doing the streaming side, Request is doing more traditional invoicing, you have everybody up and down the stack that's working on this. It's all about how do we enable digital assets to uh, uh, enable enterprises to adopt digital assets, and what are the hooks that are get them excited? Is the hook, hey, we can suddenly have a smaller AR department because all of this just these streams back and forth? Is the hook that, hey, we have more confidence in our uh, in our uh, accounting because it's all on chain? There's different hooks for different businesses, but it's really exciting to see it coming together. Going back to what you said about you know, all the steps you normally have to take, you have to wire, you have to check, you know, get social security number, whatever it may be. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the saying that the fastest way to send a million dollars to somebody in Europe is to actually fly it over there. <laughs> yeah, but it's, probably, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's always fastest. It's in some cases cheapest as well. I mean, I still remember the first time I sent something to India. I mean, it was, we, I didn't even think about it and I got a $500, $600 uh, fee tacked on the other side of it accidentally. It was just, you know, the, these, these current financial systems are, you know, what everyone, crypto, it's, it's a living, breathing entity that everyone has different opinions about. And look at, you can look at something like FTX and say, oh, it's all fraud. You can look at something like what we're doing and say it's all enterprise. It's, it's obviously a, a mix of all of these. But at the end of the day, it really is about, uh, in some ways, attacking that middleman, right? It's a, taking that middleman, whether it be banking, whatever it is, and, and going after them saying, like, we don't really need this anymore. Like, we don't need someone settling a, a payment, like, which all they're doing is flipping a bit in a database. Like, I don't need you to flip that bit in the database. Like, I can flip a bit in this database over here just fine. So that's, what, that's one of the things that's so exciting about crypto and so revolutionary about it in general. If you separate all the noise about NFTs, all the noise about everything else, this is a, a way of doing peer-to-peer -peer value transfer that we've never really had in the same way that then enables use cases like these streaming payment systems, these, you know, all of these different use cases that we get excited about. You mentioned Nike. What specifically are you doing for Nike? Uh, we help them with their with their accounting. So this is, you know, there's a they get revenue from selling NFTs and doing airdrops. Like just yesterday, they actually did a uh, airdrop of uh, virtual sneakers. They get a bunch of revenue from that that they have to do revenue recognition uh, for tokens. So they, as you're getting the tokens, you actually have to recognize the revenue, get it onto your books, uh, categorize it, all that kind of stuff. So it's a uh, it's a large, tricky project to handle at scale. Now, why haven't the traditional ERP systems like SAP or Oracle, why haven't they just updated their systems to do what it is you're doing as sort of a middleman? You talked about middlemen, but now you're the middle guy in between these enterprises and those ERP systems. It seems like they would kind of get hip to all of this and update their systems. They, they might at some point, and you know, we talked about decimal points. We talked a little bit about this idea that it, it bridges two modules, and like, you know, uh, there's the old uh, uh, principle, what is it, uh, Conway's Law, where you tend to ship your organization. So that even, like, there's this really like, if you get into like organizational theory, there's an organizational theory reason, which is that you have a Forex group at an ERP company, and then you have a inventory group, and suddenly you have a turf war deciding who actually has to pick up blockchain. And so if you, are you going to give the VP at the company who you you like the best the opportunity to go work on his own little project, well then both those teams are going to be resilient, like resistant to you actually bringing that in. I mean, there's complexity that gets into this and doing this with big companies. I don't tend to worry about big companies that way uh, from that side. But then the other way is that uh, 
the blockchains are incredibly difficult to integrate with. So the same question could be asked of why they didn't build their own banking integrations. So almost all the big ERPs use someone like Plaid that actually has built out all the banking integrations. And that's because doing banking integrations is very, very difficult. Doing blockchain exchange custodian integrations is incredibly difficult. So uh, you are basically having to deal with hundreds of APIs that are poorly documented, they're complex uh, in all sides, and uh, it's tough. So we, you know, we think we sit in that middle area really well. You know, we don't try to do anything that the, that the ERPs do. We don't have a PNL report because that's what the ERP does. We just help bridge the gap between them. Great. Well, uh, Patrick White, co-founder, CEO of Bitwave, uh, the producer of this event here, Enterprise Digital Asset Summit. Thank you very much for joining us on the Blockchain Journal podcast. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.